is October 16, 2008. We're at the home of Mr. Glenn Norris at his home in Greeley, Colorado. My name is Brad Hoops. I'm the interviewer for the Northern Colorado Veterans History Project. Welcome, Glenn, and thanks for uh, participating today. Well, you're welcome, man. I'd be glad to. Well, let's start out if we can, then. Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, uh, your date of birth, where you were born, a little bit about your family. Well, I was born May 23rd, 1926, in Woodston, Kansas. Okay. And uh, uh, folks moved to, when I was three months old, they moved from Kansas to Greeley. And my dad, he had a Model T truck with a little hand crank dump box on it. It was to haul about a half a ton at a time. And he helped to haul gravel for 11th Avenue here in town when they got ready to pave it and stuff. <laughs> now, what brought him out from uh, here from Kansas? Well, uh, with Mom and the, my brothers and us came out on the train. And he loaded everything on this Model T truck and came out because the grasshoppers and, and uh, dust arms run them out of Kansas. I'll be darned. So they were, part, they were caught in the Dust Bowl? And... And yeah, they were in the Dust Bowl there in 26. And the uh, grasshoppers are so thick, Dad said he was eating the handles out of the pitchforks. Is that right? <laughs> Holy cow. Uh, and how many brothers and sisters did you have? I got, uh, there's uh, four brothers. And, and well, f three brothers and one sister makes five of us all together. And you all served? Uh, all served in the service during World War II. I'll be darned. Uh, yeah. What were you doing prior to entering the service? I was going to school. And uh, my dad had a wrecking yard here in Greeley, like his new and used auto parts, down on 11th Avenue there. He started out working with A.B. Gold. And... Uh, he had this old Model T, and he was needing parts, and and uh, he knew a guy had that old Model T that he wanted to get rid of, so Dad bought it from him for five dollars, and uh, he got parts to fix up his Model T to keep it running, and huh. he was working for Med A B Gold, and then that Model T sat there in the yard, and people come down want to buy something off of it, so he sold it. And he said that was working pretty good, so he got a chance, he bought another one. And the first thing he knew, he had three or four there in the yard, he was selling parts off of, and got him started in the business. Oh, yeah, and you and, helped him out? In 1932, he started that. And uh, I worked on weekends uh, when I was a kid, and uh, people stopped there, he was open seven days a week. and. Uh, on Sunday, people would stop and they'd buy something wrong with their car or generator or stuff wasn't working, and we'd check it out and it'd be the cutout and they said, "Well, can you put it on?" So I'd put it on for them and wire it up and fix it and get it to go on, and they always give me a quarter or fifty cents tip, you know, for doing it. I had enough to go to show and have a bag of popcorn and have <laughs> some change. <laughs> Uh, do you remember where you were uh, when you heard that Pearl Harbor had been bombed? Uh, Pearl Harbor, that was in 41. Uh, yeah, I think I, I was uh, in school and we uh, heard it through, through the teachers and that at the school. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, I don't remember what day it was in 41, but... Uh, December 7th. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but I mean... Oh, it was a Sunday. Well, it was a Sunday. Yeah. Well, then I was probably at home. Oh, okay. okay. And uh, folks probably heard it on the radio. Gotcha, gotcha. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, when you entered the service, had you graduated from high school? Or tell us how you got into the service, no, I guess. No, uh, I, uh, I hadn't graduated or anything. I, I just... Uh, was old enough to go, and I just decided I'd go. Is that so right? So I, I just quit school and joined the Navy and went. Huh. Another friend of mine, uh, we joined together, and and then they shipped us out together on the train. We got up to Fergus, Idaho, and standing in line, 
and uh, there's a guy coming down counting and he run his arm between Larry and I and he says, you go to Camp Benyon, you go to Camp Ward, separated us right there. I'll be darned. <laughs> now, now, of all the services, why did you choose the uh, the Navy? Because I didn't want to live in a mud hole and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and crawl around on the ground. And so I joined the Navy where you could have a, a clean bed and hot meals and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, after you guys got separated, you went off to talk, tell your story from there on? Well, uh, we finished boot camp and then we came home about the same time on boot leave. We got together and then he left and went back before I did and I was to report back to Pier 91 in Seattle. And we got up there, by Larry met me at the gate and helped me carry my sea bag down. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. yeah. And then he shipped out of there first, and uh, I don't know where he went at that time, but I was uh, set there at 91 and went through firefighting school over Bremerton, Washington. And, uh, and then when they shipped us all out, a whole bunch of us together, down to Astoria, and then we got aboard the ship. Now, so uh, fireman was your specialty on the ship? Is, or? Yes, I was in the engine room, I was the fireman, but okay. uh, uh, they sent everybody pretty much to a firefighting school. Oh, okay, okay. Because, you know, the ship gets fire, everybody gets in. Yeah, yeah. How, how was your transition from, from, uh, from school and a civilian into military life? Was that much of a shock to you? or? Uh? No. Uh, to me, I kind of enjoyed it. It, uh, it was, uh, I was learning a lot and everything, and uh, there's a lot of good guys there, and we, we was actually having fun together yeah. and enjoying it. Yeah. And then we got on the ship, and uh, we made a run up along Alaska uh, for the trial run of the ship, and uh, we had a welder aboard, and, and they kept him busy because it was leaking all over. Now, this was the was this the Lubbock at this yes, time? Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it was the maiden voyage for the Lubbock. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you'd said earlier, uh, how long did it take to build that ship? Well, it, it took about uh, three to four minutes to lay the keel, and seven days to finish it, because huh. everything was built in sections. And once they got the keel set, they just started picking section up and setting them down and welding together. Huh. And uh, they missed welding everything on the side of it and it was leaking on this uh, initial run. And we had a welder inside, he was welding it up all the time. We got back down to Astoria why they put divers in uh, underwater and was welding underwater. Uh, that's the first time I ever heard or seen of that. Yeah. Yeah. Being able to arc weld underwater. Huh, I'll be darned. And, and then from that maiden voyage, did you guys ship out then? For then how we went to San Diego and loaded up with uh, tractor tires, truck tires, and everything, you know, and hauled them to Pearl Harbor. So the Lubbock was a supply ship then, or uh, what kind of ship well, was it? Well, it was a troop and supply ship, both. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it had four cargo holes in it, and uh, it... Uh, could carry 2,000 troops, plus 500 crew, and uh, so we uh, we took off and went down to, to, from San Diego to Hawaii, and then from there, I think it was Guam, we, we went up and unloaded some stuff there, and then we wound up going to Guam, and, and then over to the Philippines, Subic Bay, and over through there, and you know, and was always picking up stuff and delivering from one place to another. Wound up down by uh, the islands, bound by Australia, and round through there delivering stuff and picking up different things and delivering, moving them around. Oh, and yeah. we. Uh, we got ready to go to Iwo Jima while we loaded up with ammunition and uh, stuff and it was loaded so heavy with ammunition and jeeps and tanks and stuff such as that and 2,000 troops, it, 
with all the explosives, they wouldn't let us travel with the convoy. We had to trail it. Did that uh, did that play on your mind at all? That you were kind of riding on a powder keg? Uh, yeah, well, some, yeah. Uh, not so much until a Jap sub started falling. Oh, uh, geez. Two-man Jap sub. And uh, they was followed us for a couple of days, and we had notified the fleet. And they sent back sub chasers back, and they went back there and dropped a couple of depth charges, and that sub popped up like a cork, and the flag started to laugh. <laughs> and they just picked that sub up and set it on their deck and took it away. <laughs> oh, is that right? and, and it had two torpedoes on it. Oh, geez. But the only thing they figure that we were heading in that direction by ourselves, mm. they couldn't figure why, so that's the reason. We figured that was the reason they didn't uh, torpedo us. Uh, trying to figure out where you were going, huh? Yeah. Oh, okay. And then we met up with the convoy uh, the day before the invasion. And, uh, and we, uh, we served the troops and everybody with a big turkey dinner and with all the trimmings and everything. Cigars handed out, cigarettes and everything else. What was the mood of the ship, particularly with the Marines and stuff? They're about ready to go on board. Do you remember what it was like? Uh, uh, there was a lot of them pretty depressed and worried because they were going knew they were going to have to go ashore into battle. Mm. And uh, one of the guys that uh, I had at that time, I was when they had troops on, they took me up and work in the galley. And uh, they one of the guys I had up there that uh, Marines work in KP, he uh, asked me if I would mail some letters for him when I got back to the States to his home because if he mailed them they would cut them up. <laughs> oh right, yeah. And so I did. I, I He had two big letters and stuff and I I mailed him. I don't know how that ever turned out. Yeah, you have any I idea don't know how whether he he made it or not. I'll be done. Huh. Of course, we lost 6,000 the first day there on the Evil Jeez. Now, how far offshore were you guys from? Well, we were so close we had to pull anchor and move out because they were shooting mortars at us. Oh, my gosh. And getting awful close. So we had to pull anchor and move. And uh, we were, I was on the five inch gun. We were shooting at the hill trying to knock out pillboxes up there in those caves. Yeah. And we could shoot in, right in the cave, and the dust would come out. Before the dust settled, they were there shooting out again. Huh. Well, what we found out was they'd fire, pull back off to the side, we'd shoot in, they'd come back up and back, right. shoot out again. So you had, you more or less had a front row seat to that invasion then, from where you, from oh, your viewpoint. Yeah, yeah, we were we were right there on loading troops, and uh, we had the uh, zeros and kamikazes trying to stop us from unloading the troops and stuff. We yeah, we was right there at Green Beach is where we was at, and uh, they had the beaches areas colored for different ships to unload their troops and stuff and the equipment, and we was unloading tanks and jeeps and, and stuff and sending over which was getting stuck in the volcanic ash. The Japs had cleaned that island off and put all this ash around the edge just for that purpose. Hmm. And then when they got stuck, they'd shoot them up with mortars. Wow, wow. And uh, they were firing mortars at us. They, they was coming so close that they were shaking the ship pretty hard. How, how does, what's a person thinking? I mean, I'm trying to imagine never being in battle myself What's going through your mind during this? You're being shot at. You got kamikazes coming at you. How do you well, how do you function? Or what actually, do you... you see, I was on the phones for the five inch, and uh, we were so busy watching for kamikazes and and diving for cover and stuff that you really wasn't thinking anything. Only trying to protect yourself and and uh, do your job and. Just running on adrenaline, or uh... yeah, yeah, you were, you, yeah. you were, yeah, yeah. It, uh, it uh, was. Uh, you didn't have time to stop and think what was, you know. Huh. 
Uh, whether you were scared or what, you just doing what you had to do. How long were you guys in that position before you had everything unloaded and backed out? Or Well, uh, we didn't have everything unloaded before we moved out because they, they were shooting mortars at us and getting too close. Mm. And uh, so we moved out further. And then a battle wagon come around. Now, what's a battle wagon? Explain to us that don't. Uh, the, the big uh, battle wagon with the big guns. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, they pulled around back of us, and we didn't even notice them. And uh, since we, our five inch wasn't doing any good on that hill, this battle wagon pulled around there. And when they fired those three 16s, a lot of us got knocked. Concussion knocked us down on our knees. And Is stuff. that right? One guy went over the rail and really, yeah, yeah. And Must have the been boy, that, that incredible sound. And... <laughs> that concussion from them really shook the whole ship. Just rocked just from it, you know. Holy cow! But when they hit that hill up there, that was the end of that there uh, Japanese fill box up there. <laughs> Uh, it, it stopped that. It took in the whole side of that hill. <laughs> wow, wow. You know, those big 16s out yeah, there. Well, then how long were you there at Emo? Uh, seven days. Seven days? Yeah, and then we pulled out, to, and it took 17 days for them to finish right. the fight. Yeah. And uh, we were there seven days, and then we pulled out. We, we served as a first aid station for the wounded... Uh, but the serious wounded that we picked up, they took straight to the hospital ships where they had uh, operating rooms mm -hmm. and everything in place equipped to take care of the serious. And we took care of the minor wounds and stuff. And some of them got patched up and went right back over again. Mm. And, uh, it, uh, and we seen the flag go up and uh, we were talking about it, hey, look at there, we got the flag up already. And that was the first day. And then all of a sudden it was down. Said, hey, the flag's got down. And then we looked and said, oh, they're putting it back up. And then we found out there was two flags. Yeah. The first one, an uh, Army officer, Marine officer, wanted that flag for himself. So he sent him up with another flag take that one down, put this one up, bring that other one to him. And when the second flag went up, two guys got killed putting it up. Mm, wow. And uh, this Army officer, he he should enjoy that flag pretty much. Wow. Have you ever seen, uh, you know, various Hollywood movies that, that they put out? Are they, did they do a good job of making it, as, from uh, what you that, can tell? Uh, flags of our fathers, uh -huh. that's getting pretty accurate. Was it? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I've got it, and uh, I, I've i run it twice, and uh, that is pretty close. Is it? Uh -huh. I, I understood a lot of that. It was made by the uh, military r film that they took, you know, of the battle, and the newscasters that uh, was there at the time uh, f filming some of it, and it's all in black and white because they didn't have color then. Right, right. But it, uh, it's it's pretty accurate. Yeah, mm. it's it's pretty accurate. Did you have any interaction with uh, the Marines that were coming back when you were or first aid station? Did you deal with any any interaction? No, with I them? didn't on that okay. because I was back on the five inch gun, and uh, the uh, the uh, boats running back and forth, bringing them in there for first aid, and uh, and they would take them right into the sick bay. Gotcha. And uh -huh. and. and uh, treat them and everything. And those that was, they treated that needed to go to the hospital ships, then they would put them on another boat and take them over. And ones that was, could go back, went back to over. We were talking about the island. Can you uh, give us a description of what the sea around it looked like? Uh, uh, well, it was rough. It was, it was a cold, uh, kind of a drowsy, rainy day. Uh, it uh, wasn't a hard rain, just a misty and cold and windy and, and water was rough. And, and yeah. From what I understand, you could see ships for as far as you could see. Was that? Oh, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Must have been a sight. Yeah, I, well, you figure 
they had close to 60,000 Marines on there. And a ship like mine, the troop ships, would carry 2,000. So how many ships would it take to carry 60,000? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, at least 30 ships just for troops alone. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, Plus the the destroyers, yeah. the, the aircraft carriers, the battle wagons, the hospital ships, the radio ships, and all this stuff around there. Uh, I heard one time, and I, I can't remember, uh, but I think they said it was pretty close to 7,000 ships around that island. Boy, that must have been All a sight. the way around it, you know. That must have just been a sight to see. Yeah, yeah. and it, it, it was quite a deal. It, uh, now, was that the first battle that Lubbock had been in, or had you been in any yeah, of the battles? Yeah, that was the first battle. Okay. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah we, we served... Uh, 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 hauling supplies around mm -hmm. different places uh, uh, all the time, and uh, that uh, we hauled supplies into Manila because it had just been taken back. And we were hauling supplies in there to help set up stations and stuff and things there, and, and that was old MacArthur. You know, he says, "I will be back." I got a picture of him in there that. It's where he's waiting in the water. Yeah. I'm back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, where did you guys sail in from uh, from Iwo Jima then? Where'd you, you know, your next... Uh... We we picked up, uh, we went down to, I think it was Subic Bay, and we had to go into dry dock because we got a, a line wrapped around the shaft, and the, the stern tube bearing on the shaft is lubricated by water, and that line wrapped around it shut the water off, burnt the bearing out. So we went into dry dock there and they put in a new bearing and they had put in a new shaft and bearing. And then we went and hooked up the supplies and stuff and then went to Okinawa. Oh and boy. The invasion there. Walk us through that uh, through that experience. Well that was that was a lot heavier we had to have our smoke machines going all the way around, people running around with smoke machines to cover it up. To, to cover from the kamikazes? Kamikazes and zeros, it was uh, thick. Uh, they were just like bees up there, everywhere. Wow. And they uh, they were trying, really trying to stop us from unloading troops and stuff. They, they were trying to get the pea boats and everything else. And we had one uh, kamikaze covered in at us and one of our gunners on the 40 millimeter started shooting at it and he hit the nose of it just enough to tip it up and it glided right over our deck. We could have touched it with our hands. Is that right? Touched the wheels when it went over. Oh, geez. And it had a big, looked like two 50 gallon barrels tied together underneath it and we figured those were full of gasoline so that when it crashed it'd blow up and catch fire. Oh, man. And, but they went out and got the pilot out of that plane, which was dead, and they brought him board ship, and they found a billfold that uh, he had a California ID card, driver's license, and an ID card for California State College, hmm. and a pet picture of Betty Grable. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, evidently, see, at that time, they'd come over here and go to college. Yeah. When they went back to visit their folks, they would Japan wouldn't let them come back. Gotcha. They put them in service, and uh, uh, so that's uh, he was smart enough that he could be learned to be a pilot. So they kept him there, uh, and uh, but that that was kind of surprising that he had a California driver's license and a California college state college ID card. That was kind of surprised. Hmm. Yeah. Which which of the two battles were the worst for you? Do you think, uh, experience wise, as far as what went on? Well, uh, where we uh, <laughs> we were having our decks and everything scraped on both of them by zeros and kamikazes flying around. They were they were both about the same. You 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 were busy with looking up all the time, watching. 
Uh, and uh, at Evo, I was on the phone for the five inch gun. Phone meeting call. And they would in. announce zeros coming in on the fan tail. And so I'd holler at the guys at the gun, and they'd run for the boathouse to get in undercover. And I was hooked into a, a gear locker with the phone, so I jump in there, pull the hatch shut, and three of them hit there on that hatch just as I shut the hatch. And I could see daylight through one of them, Jeez. but it never come through. <laughs> but it, it was that close. I'll be darned. And made you worry a little bit. Oh, sure. Made, yeah. you, made you think. Uh, how did? And then how long were you guys there in Okinawa? We were there in Okinawa, I think it was about five days. Okay. Uh, I can't remember for sure, sure. just yeah. what it was, but then we left there and went back down into the Philippines. And, and uh, I think that was the first load of troops that we loaded up there in the Philippines. We loaded up with troops and uh, headed back to the States. And this was after uh, the Japanese surrendered, after they dropped the bomb. Do you remember where you were when uh, you had heard of VJ Day and uh, what that was like? No, no I, I, I don't remember just where we were at at that time. But uh, there was a lot of yipping and yelling across board ship. Kind of a relief and, that you'd made it, yeah. Yeah, the, the, we come back to the States in December of 45. And the 20th day of December, we hit that tidal wave that hit Pearl Harbor in 45. Hmm. And uh, we sat out there, turned 16 knots, for four days and never moved. Just sit there and bobbed around like a cork. Well, that, that, that leads to a question I usually ask earlier on. Um, here we got a boy from Greeley, Colorado, which is a landlocked state. What was it like getting out on the, on the, on, on the ocean? Did you get your sea legs, or how was that adjustment? Yeah, it, it, well, it took you a little while to get them, but you, you got them. And I had the, the, when I had the Marines on there, and I uh, had them you know, working in the galley there, KP, and took them down to the reefers to get potatoes. We needed 18 sacks of potatoes. And we went down there to get them and had them carry them out. So they had to carry them up the ladder. Well, that ladder was sideways of the ship. And that ship would roll, and they'd roll that way. And them guys get them spuds on their shoulder and start up and that ship would roll and they'd drop them and they'd stumble forward and, and I said well you guys got to get your sea legs and I said here I'll show you how and I pick them up and I'd take carry them up <laughs> put them down up above and then they'd drag them down because they couldn't pick them up and walk the lengthwise of the ship because it was rolling and they couldn't they would fall against the bulkhead and back and forth, you know. So they'd just drag them down <laughs> to the mess hall. <laughs> uh, uh. But uh, I got a couple of them kind of trained, taught how to do it. You know, you got to, when that ship rolls back, you got to lean forward. And then when it goes the other way, you lean back. But you just keep going on up. And you learn after a while. Uh. What was life like on the ship? What were conditions like as far as sleeping? With, uh, what was the food like? Uh, what'd you do for entertainment uh, on your uh, downtime? Well, entertainment, we didn't have anything. Right. They had a piano in the mess hall, and there was a couple guys go in there and play around with it. You know, they couldn't really play, but they'd go in there and play around. And sometimes they'd, guys would get together and try to sing or something with it. But, uh, you know, they uh, it was... Uh, you just spent most of the time was watching the guys play poker and this and that and, uh -huh. and uh, visiting with each other. Sometimes topside or just watching out, you know, when it was under, underway. Uh -huh. and, yeah, it, uh, how, how was the food and such? We had three cooks and uh, we had one good cook. Uh -oh. <laughs> He was, a, he was a chef from New York, 
and he could take powdered eggs and make them look like fresh eggs. The other two guys, they'd take and fix them. They'd come out black, green, every other color. You didn't know what you were getting, but they were powdered eggs. Yeah. And but this other guy, he was he was good cook. Him and I got to where we got uh, pretty good friends, and he when we got troops, why he wanted me up there to help him in the galley. Uh -huh. So I learned a lot of cooking off of him. Yeah, yeah. And sleeping conditions, what were they like? Well, we, we had our bunks there and there. There was five high, and you just crawl in your bunk and sleep. But uh, you got used to it. Uh, you rolled a little bit, but you you got used to it. With when you was underway, you didn't it didn't bother you. Huh. But it'd take a while to do that. <laughs> I'll bet. Uh. Then you get into rough water of him and stuff. He was a good cook, and but that guy. You'd never see him eat. He says, I absorb all of it through the steam and stuff. Really? And he says, he'll eat, eat a little toast in the morning, and coffee was his main thing. Huh. But he says, I absorb so much that he says, I don't get hungry. Is that yeah. right? Huh. But yeah, he, was, he was a good cook. The other two, they didn't care. They went through uh, <coughs> Navy cook school, you know, for a couple of weeks, and that was it. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the home. We, uh, we got chicken aboard that ship in crates. And the first time I opened up one of those crates, I got to looking at it, and it says, packed in 1926. Oh, no. <laughs> Frozen chicken. Uh, chickens the same age as I was. <laughs> oh, no. And they still prepared them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. geez. Yeah, they, that's what they had in stockpile that they were sending out there. Oh, my. For the guys to have, you know. Uh, and it was never like shoe leather, but. <laughs> well, once again, here here's a, a kid from, from Greeley. Uh, I don't imagine you'd traveled too much far away from home growing no, up no. and now you're you're all over the South Pacific all these exotic yeah. locations what was that like from from your viewpoint as a, a young kid a green well, kid really? I, I, I was really uh, enjoying it I guess you could say I was kind of excited about yeah, it yeah uh, being out there and enjoying it and because you know you always seen uh, in movies uh, uh, a kid gets stole away on a ship yeah, and go right. to sea and stuff, and I always thought about that. And but uh, yeah, I I, I think it kind of and it just uh, enjoyed it. Yeah. What was some of your favorite locations? Do you remember anything that really sticks out in your mind that you really enjoyed? Uh, uh no. Well, no, we didn't we didn't get shore too much. Oh, a lot of right. times we pull in, we were busy loading or unloading. Oh, okay. And we didn't have docks to pull up to. We anchored out, and boats come out with supplies, gotcha. and we'd load, okay, and then unload, and because uh, so we didn't really get into on shore. Hmm. They put us on one island called Mog Mog Island for a beer party, and they sent uh, half the crew over there and sent over some beer and. You, they allowed you about two beers a piece. Well, one was enough for me, <laughs> and the other guys they <laughs> they done pretty good. But it, it you could have thrown a rock either direction and hit water on that island. <laughs> uh. It wasn't big enough to do anything. And, and then we would get mail every six months whenever it could catch up with us. That know. was my next question. It was yeah. going to be my next question. How communications was were yeah, it as wasn't far as very good because. Uh, we we'd get mail. We'd get four or five letters in a bunch, you know, and uh, we got mail that was well eight, ten months old, you know, mm. or catch up with it. They'd send it to some place, and while we'd just laughed, you know, it's, so it it uh, was hard to keep it up and. But we uh, we got mail about every six months. Like that. Well, you said that all five uh, of you kids were in the service. Were you able to keep track of how? Well, I didn't know where they were at except there? except for my oldest brother. He was uh, on the islands up by 
Alaska up there, uh, keeping the Japs from crossing up there and coming across and coming down through Alaska. He was stationed up there all the time. He, he was drafted in 41 and uh, he went off up through, the, that's where they sent him. And he spent all his time up there. And he got uh, discharged in uh, 45, right after the Japs had surrendered. He got discharged and came along. And my sister, she got a medical discharge earlier. She was stationed back in the Pennsylvania and around there where all the coal mines were. And she says, the street lights would be on all day and you still couldn't see anything, couldn't hardly see the street lights from the coal dust and oh, the stuff in the air. And uh, she got asthma and stuff from it. So she got a medical discharge. And, uh, and my other brother, uh, Lee, was in the Navy. He was down in Florida, at Pensacola down there, and uh, he st stayed down there all the time. And my younger brother, he went into the Merchant Marines and uh, spent a little time in there, and he got out, and then he joined the Marine Corps, and uh, that was in the last part of 45 and just about the time the Japs surrendered. But he did get over to Japan and he was over there about two weeks and they put him on another ship and sent him back. Hmm. And, uh, but uh, he, uh, so that, that's about the way it was. Yeah. Did, did he, uh, did your folks ever talk about, I mean it had to have been hard on your folks with all five of you gone and you know, with, you were probably censored as to where you could tell where you were well, and, and yeah, mail wasn't, we, Mail wasn't good. I mean, yeah. did your mom ever talk about that she worried? She, she said, you got to be careful what you're saying because she says they cut it out so much that yeah. I, I can't make out. And, you know, we, I couldn't tell them where I yeah. was at. Right. Now, my brothers here in the States, yeah. they could. Right. They knew where they was yeah. at. And they'd make phone calls. Yeah. And I made one phone call, and that was in December of 45. And I left the uh, States in, uh, I think it was September of 44. <laughs> uh, I'll be and done. I got to make one phone call. In that whole time? <laughs> in that whole time, yeah. Uh. And, well, we pulled back in the States underneath the Golden Gate Bridge Christmas Eve of 45. Uh, what was that? you remember that feeling? What that was like to finally be well, back in the States? Well, yeah, and... the, the troops we had on, we picked up in... Uh, in uh, Manila, over there, they uh, were all up on deck looking for the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was foggy. And all of a sudden, it here was the bridge, and they cut out a uh, yelling and a hollering. And they're back in the states, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was quite a, a thrill, a commotion aboard ship over that. Now, is that where you disembarked for the last time, or? No, uh, we went back. Uh, crossed and went to China and picked up troops up there and then came back to the States again and we made another trip to China, picked up some more troops and came back and then I got off the ship in, uh, uh, let's see, it was April. I got off uh, down in San Diego and they were just leaving with some flies and headed back over to the Philippines again and to her with some supplies and things and to get up some more troops and bring them back. Now why did you get off uh, at that I point? had points. Oh you had enough points, okay. I had enough okay. points to get off on, on the, and they, they put me on the dock and I stood there and watched the ship pull out. I was the only one that got off and they said somebody will be here to pick you up. Well. That, that was about 8 o'clock in the morning, and 4 o'clock that afternoon, somebody came to pick me up. Oh, jeez. With one of those old Ford school bus, like, buses that they had, military had then. They drove out that bus all the way from Shoemaker, California, down to San Diego to pick me up and take me back to Shoemaker in that, that Shoemaker bus. Shoemaker was up in Northern California, Yeah, up there by Oakland. Oh, jeez. And they should have gave him a car to pick me up. I was just picking up one guy. Yeah. And yeah. he drove that old bus down there. Ah. 
and uh, you know it had to use enough gas for five cars. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, that uh, we got back up to Shoemaker, California, late that night, and then uh, they stuck me in. The guy stuck me in a barracks, and. Uh, I was the only one in there, and I I sat in there, and I go, well they're going to chow, so I went out and get in line, went went to the mess hall, had breakfast and stuff, and then I'd go back to the barracks because somebody was supposed to pick me up there, tell me what's what, and I was there about three days, and uh, I was sitting out on the steps of the barracks, and the jeep come down through there, and it stopped, and the guy, Guy motioned me over. I went over there. He was a lieutenant. He says, "What are you doing there?" I says, "Well, that's where they put me and told me to stay." How long you been there? I told him. Oh God! He says, "Go get your sea bag and stuff." And he says, "He took me to another. They put me in the wrong barracks." Oh no! <laughs> and he took me down and. Then right away, then well, they got lined up to get discharged in May. I'll and be back. Got discharged on on my birthday, May the twenty third. There at Camp Shoemaker. Yeah, yeah. Shoemaker, in California. Yeah. And then you, what? From there, just made your way home, or what? Yeah, that after I got my discharge the next day, why, I pack up your sea bag and leave. You're gone. So I walked out the gate and tried to find a way home because there. All the buses and trains and everything that were on strike and <laughs> shut down. Oh, geez. So I went out and started thumbing down the hitchhiking down the road, and and a guy he stopped and picked me up. He he took me down about halfway and then I hitchhiked some more. Finally made it down to uh, San Diego. That's where I was going to go, and then down well down to Long Beach, and. Uh, because one of the guys that was aboard ship, uh, he took, I had a 32 caliber Beretta that I let him take over on leave and put her there at his house. And so I went by after I got discharged to go down and pick it up. But I was afraid to, when they went in to get discharged, they might search your bag. And, yeah. But I brought back a Jap rifle out of the warehouse there where we were tied up there uh, when the Jap signed the surrender. Yeah, I know where it was at when the signed, Jap signed the surrender because we were tied up right across from the Missouri and watched it. Is that right? Yeah. In Tokyo Bay? Yeah. And we tied up next to this warehouse and that warehouse full of Jap rifles. So I got me a souvenir rifle. Well, half of the crew did. Yeah. And yeah, I was right there. Uh, we, uh, I was up on the boat deck with binoculars watching the Jap sign the treaty. Wow, huh? Now, um, were you, while you were docked there, were you able to get off the ship and go into into Tokyo at all, or were Yeah, you... we did. Uh, there was about six of us got together, and we went over, and then we found out we could take the train and go out to Hiroshima where they dropped a bomb. So we wanted to go out and see that. So we went out there. And uh, seen it. Describe that, if you will. Uh, well, it it uh, was just it was level there. It looked like a rubbish dump. Uh, everything just a bunch of trash, you know, dump. Except for half of a smokestack sticking up, and it, it leveled everything. Could you could you even imagine what that was like? What that bomb was like? Uh, uh, I mean, it, had you any uh, idea? It had a area cleaned off there of about four football fields. Just just everything flattened. Huh. Huh. And what was Tokyo? What did Tokyo look like? Uh, was that pretty damaged as well? Well, it, it had some damage but because uh, they've been bombing there yeah, too, right. you know. But uh, uh, they uh, had a lot of the uh, buildings roped off in areas that you couldn't get into. And shore patrol and that keeping you out of certain areas. One area there, there they 
they wouldn't let you in. They said, don't go in there. There's, uh, you go in there, you may not come back. Wow. And, and, Did you have much interaction with the Japanese civilians at all? or? Uh, no, no. They, they were all out there trying to sell stuff. And Japanese money, you, it was laying all over the street. You could just pick it up and step into a store and buy stuff with it. <laughs> it was worthless, yeah, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, it, we bought a few things and that, and, but uh, uh, we, that, we got off there and then we got off in China, up there. And they, they had uh, MPs and shore patrol and that around, keeping you out of certain areas. One area was, you didn't go across there, it says that's the Mongols area. And you talk about big people, those Mongols, they look seven foot tall, <laughs> 300 pounds more, <laughs> they're big people. Uh, wow. Yeah, you just get a look at them, you, you say, yeah, I don't want to go up there. Uh, yeah, but the shore patrol was, they had several shore patrols up there for keeping people out of them areas. Mm. They were, they were scary people. Mm. Wow. We need to uh, back up a minute and talk about your discharge. Can you describe, tell us uh, a historical thing about that day? Well, yeah. We, your we were all, uh, God took us off over into a, a uh, theater type building with that stage and seats and everything, you know. And uh, we were all seated in there and they were getting ready for this discharge and that. And uh, they were getting ready to start, as they was handing out papers for us, you know, to sign and this and that and fill out. And just about the time they started to, the procedure of starting to call names in walked a guy in there and everybody stood up and I looked around and said, what's going on? And so I stood up and it was uh, President Truman. Wow. And he come in, he was there inspecting the base and stuff, walked around and he uh, heard about the guys getting discharged and he come over shook every one of them's hand and thanked them for their service and everything. And, uh, and then later, later on, they sent me. I, uh, I got a letter from President Truman after that thanking me for my services yeah. and stuff. Uh, and I'll be done. That kind of, you know, that kind of shake you up when the president comes in. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and he actually shook his hand? And, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he was a pretty nice guy. He wasn't a very big guy, but yeah. he was he was a nice guy. Mm -hmm. he was nice, uh, soft spoken, and thanked everybody and shook everybody's hand. And, and uh, you don't expect that. You yeah, know? Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's something that you just don't expect to happen. But they claimed he was just there inspecting the base and heard about it, and so. Huh. Oh, that's fascinating. He came over to do that, and, which was nice of him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, getting back to uh, to your uh, the discharge, then you you went down to to Long Beach and picked up your your uh, pistol, and then where'd you go from there? Did you come back to Colorado? Well, or? I I found a carpool thing there at Long Beach, uh, where they uh, you go in and you pay them so much and. You get in the car with four or five others, and and they were headed for Denver. So I rode that with that car back to Denver. Okay. And uh, in the carpool, and I got in Denver, and uh, I stayed overnight there. And then next day I caught the bus out and came on home to Greeley. Got off the bus here in Greeley, and my sea bag and stuff, and over my shoulder and started walking and walked home and dad he was out in the store building and he had a store he built a store on front of the house and uh, 
So I walked up and stepped into the side door, which he could, his desk was right back there and, and along the side. And I stepped in there and looked at him. And I said, well, hi, Dad. And he looked up and <laughs> really surprised. They didn't know you were coming home. No, I hadn't. Huh. I didn't call him or nothing. Yeah. It kind of surprised them that I got to come home. They didn't know where I was. All the other kids were home, except for my younger one. He was still in the Marine Corps, and then he stayed in uh, Utah. He didn't, he didn't even come back home after <coughs> after he got discharged. He went to st stationed there in uh, Utah to Marine Base, and then he, when he got discharged, he got a job there and went to work there. Huh. What was it like uh, finally being home? Do you remember? That? Well, it, it was pretty good, but uh, things hadn't changed a whole lot uh, as far as <coughs> building construction or anything. It's still a small town. Yeah. And half of the streets were dirt and everything. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, did you take some time off uh, when you got home, or did you go right to work or school, uh, or what? Uh, where did you go from there then? I. Uh, the next day I was working there in the yard. Yeah, was that right? Yeah. No time for rest. Huh? Yeah, I, well, d Dad needed some help, yeah. so I just went out and went to working. And one, uh, it was about, oh, I'd say about a year. I've been home about a year. And a guy walked into the store building, and he was an electrician aboard ship. Huh. And he was from Kansas. He come out here looking for car parts and stuff, and he's looking for a set of seats for a certain car. So I took him out and showed him some seats and stuff, and sold him some seats for the. He was restoring the car. But <coughs> he didn't realize he was just coming for parts. He didn't realize. You no, were he didn't know that I was there. And <laughs> did you recognize each other, or how did? Yeah, I looked there. at him and I said, well, "What the hell are you doing here?" And he, <laughs> he, he looked at me and he started laughing. And he said, "Oh God." Oh, he done. Huh? <laughs> yeah, he, uh, he, the engineers, the A division and the electrical division, and them all was in the same compartment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so he, he was just a few bunks over from me. I'll so we darn. knew each other. Huh. And then uh, what did you go on to do with, as far as a career or work uh, from... Well, I worked there. I, Dad had diabetes and he uh, was getting in kind of bad shape and he lost a leg. Mm. And I took over running the business in, uh, in 46 and uh, it, I run it till 69 and then we closed it out and quit. Dad, he he had he died in sixty five with diabetes, and mm. he was only fifty six years old when he Is died. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, mm. Yeah, he the, that's how he found out he had diabetes. Was uh, he had to go take a physical for uh, be to uh, be. Uh, Drafted, and they found out he had diabetes and wouldn't take him. See, hmm. so that was that was his uh, when he found out he had it. Hmm. Yeah. And then what'd you do after after you sold the the business? Well, after I sold the business, out I went to work for Flatiron Paving Company here in Greeley, and I worked for them for twenty years, and and then retired in. Uh, 1990 uh, to take care of my third wife. She uh, had COPD and was getting in pretty bad shape. I took care of her for nine years and and she was on oxygen 24 hours a day for nine years. And mm -hmm. So I took care of her and I was old enough to draw Social Security anyway so I just quit. Yeah. yeah. Other, if it hadn't been for that, I'd have kept on working, and you know, I just. Yeah. That she's been gone eight years now. Soon be nine years. Wow. Uh, so <coughs> besides, lost lost my second wife with cancer, and she was at forty-seven. 
when she died. My third wife was uh, was 73 when she died. And my first wife, I divorced her. <laughs> we had a divorce, and that was that was in '68, I think it was. Yeah, '68. Hmm. I went to work for Flatiron in '69, and uh, <coughs> yeah, well, I can't complain. I guess I had a fair life. Yeah. Aside from that, uh, that guy you ran into at uh, uh, at, the, at at your store, had you ever? Did you ever keep in touch with guys on the ship? Uh, uh, one we kept in track. In touch all the time. Uh, that was Ernie Parrish, which was uh, in Beloit, Kansas, and uh, I, I went to Kansas to see him, and that was in uh, '46, latter part of '46, when my first wife and I got married. When we went out there and got married there at Beloit with him, and then he moved into Ray, Colorado, and where it lived there a few years, and then he moved out of here and went to work for me in the yard. Oh, is that right? And, uh, yeah, I, and uh, we were in touch all the time, and he was about the only one that did see Cecil Brooks up at Torrington, Wyoming. We, Ernie and I looked him up and uh, went to see him once, and that was in uh, 50... 53, I think it was, yeah. we've seen him. Has there ever been any sort of uh, ship reunions at all? That yeah, we had a re ship reunion in 95, and uh, down in uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, Lou down there uh, got it started. So uh, I've got a few names off of the list that he, he got over the computer and things. And uh, there was four or five that I kept in touch with. And there's one over at Bellevue that was aboard ship there. And him and I exchanged Christmas cards and stuff every year and talk on the phone, but we've never got together. Oh, is that uh, right? I've been, I left a message for him. I said, let's, let's set a date and get together and have breakfast. Yeah. And I haven't got no response. I don't know whether he's out of town or sick or what, yeah. you know. Yeah. Because he, he's about 80, 84 or 85 now. Lou is 84. And uh, Ernie, he passed away in 90, 96. No, he passed away in 92. Because he wasn't around to go to the reunion. Mm. Mm. And... Uh, but I, there were several of them there that I got contact with and got uh, names and addresses at the reunion. And uh, one of them was old Jack. He was a lieutenant. He lived out in South Carolina. He passed away last year uh, at uh, 86. And uh, Lou is 84 now, and he's getting uh, kind of bad with his eyesight. And, uh, and he lived in Beaumont. Texas, and he's had to move. His tornadoes have tore out his hurricanes there, tore his place up a couple times. And I talked to him before this other one hit, this last one hit, and he says, oh, we're up here with my son now, because he said, we're afraid of that hurricane coming in. And so I don't know what, I haven't talked to him since. I, I usually try to call him and keep in touch that way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Can't go see him. Then another down in Louisiana that I call now and then. He was down there by that uh, one that hit down there and tore up Louisiana down there. And he's right off of the lake oh boy. on the side of it. The only thing he lost was his horse corrals. Huh. But his house was all right. And so he says, we come out pretty good. Mm. And I haven't talked to him for a while. But yeah. But he's getting bad too now. He's he's had to quit riding. His wife's still riding. She's younger than he is. And she still does. They go used to go around over the country, uh, doing 
riding with horses and stuff, these different things. Show horses and stuff. How about but, yourself? Are you, are you in pretty good health and yourself? You... Well, I think I am. Yeah, I'm, okay. I'm 82 and I still get out and ride my motorcycle every time I get a chance. <laughs> Is that right? I see it there. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, I, I got a, it's an 06 Honda Goldwing 1800 and uh, I, about two months after I got it, I took and rode it down to Roswell, New Mexico to my sister's to, for her birthday. Uh, and yeah, it, it'll roll down the road pretty good at 95, just sit there. <laughs> it rolls as good at 95, does as 65. So, <laughs> but I, I usually run between 65 and 70 <laughs> with it. I, I kicked it up on the other side of Raton Pass the traffic kind of thinned out, and uh, I just wanted to see how it would handle because I just got it. And uh, so I kicked it up to 95 because the book says don't use the cruise over 100, so I set it at 95. <laughs> That's moving right along. Uh, it is, it is. <laughs> but well, it's a nice machine. I, I've had about 17 different bikes, and this is the smooth and most comfortable and easiest one to ride. Uh. Well, if, as we start to wind down this interview, is there anything that uh, I didn't ask you or any stories, uh, anything else you wanted to talk about that we forgot to talk about? Well, not that I know of. Yeah. I, let, let me ask you. Well, I, did, well, I told you about the, the tidal wave we were in. Yeah. No, I don't think there's anything much that where it draws your attention, yeah. things that you remember, you know, yeah, the incidents yeah. and that. But Let me ask you, uh, how do you think that period of your life affected your life or played it, played a part in your life, or, or did it, or was it just... Well, yeah, I, I think it, uh, well, what should I say, it makes you grow up faster mm -hmm. and uh, makes you appreciate things more and uh, you don't take, uh, just consider everything, you know, you you enjoy stuff more, I think. Yeah. It, it's a, a experience of life that teaches you that things aren't easy. You have to enjoy and, and earn what you get. And, yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll close her down. Is there any last statement you'd like to make to anybody that'll watch this tape? Any uh, kind of an open mic to whatever you'd want to say about anything, if there is anything you'd like well, to close with? I don't know. I, it, it's a, it was a good experience, and I learned a lot that I would have never learned otherwise, and uh, I wouldn't uh, trade it for anything, but I wouldn't want to do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Glenn, I want to I want to thank you for uh, sitting down to tell your story today. But uh, more importantly, I want to thank you for your service to our country. Yeah, you're quite welcome. I uh, I was glad to be able to serve it. Uh, I, a lot more than a lot of these kids nowadays. They eh? they don't have any Americanism to them at all. They, not, they don't want to. Uh, you, you know, World War Two. It was different. Yeah. The women all went to work in factories and stuff, and the guys all went out and enlisted into the service. We all went to service. Mm. And uh, just like up there to uh, uh, World War II Memorial, uh, I thought they put the names on the wall. And they said, no, we can't do that because we don't have enough wall. Wow. He says the only one we'd done that to was the Vietnam Memorial. He said, we put a star on the, on the wall, a bunch of stars, gold stars, and each star represents a hundred guys killed in World War II. And that is, they've got a wall there, 20 feet long, three feet wide, with a bunch of these little stars representing the number of people that was killed during World War II. Hmm. Wow. And, uh, do you it, think they did the, a good job with the memorial? Yes, yeah, they did okay. a, a good job Satisfied with it. Satisfied with that. And you had a great trip uh, on the honor flight out to see Yes, you? that yeah. honor flight was great. Uh, it was uh, something that, well, I, I think 100% of the guys that went 
would have never been there if it hadn't been for that yeah. other fly. Yeah, oh, that's wonderful. They would just never have made it. And there was one died four days after the flight. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he had cancer, and he says, I'm going to go whether it kills me or not. And he went, and he came back, but he died four days later. Yeah, yeah. yeah with cancer, so yeah. at least he got to see it. Right. It was a great deal. Well, thank you very much, Glenn. Yeah, you bet. We got uh, the brown stars on each side, and we start out here with the Chinese Liberation, Philippine Liberation, and this is the Asiatic Pacific Medal, and uh, this one here, I can't remember just what it was, these two, but uh, What were you awarded the bronze stars for? Iwo Jima and Okinawa. Is that right? You get a bronze star for every uh, initial battle that you were in. Okay. And uh, so I had those two. And then above that's uh, obviously a picture of the Lubbock. Yes, that's a picture of the ship. And my picture here, boot camp picture. Oh, is that right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, there was all five of us in the service, and uh, my older brother, Bill, went into the Army first. He's to the right uh, there? Yes, to the right, and then my sister went in, and then my Lee, my brother, to the, to the left, he went in, and I went in, and then my younger brother went into Marines. All five at once, huh? Over it.